uh, meeting tonight is sponsored by the city of that home and Colfax County and Leonard's Colfax Medical Center and, and the Holiday Inn Express. Uh, so those are the sponsors uh, for the meeting tonight. Uh, I would also like to mention that uh, from uh, high school we have the FCCLA on hand. They're provided with some snacks. Uh, so uh, I know when we're talking to economic development, uh, yeah. I'd like to have a bag of popcorn and a few of the support of the FCCLA. I'm sure that they would really appreciate that. So thank you for that. On hand, we do have Dr. Dr. David Ivan. Uh, Dr. Ivan has really gone out of his way to be here tonight. Uh, he flew uh, from Detroit, Michigan this morning, and he's heading back to Detroit first thing in the morning. He's coming from uh, East Lansing, Michigan. He is on the staff at, at Michigan State University. And I'm going to read from your bio, Dr. Ivan. Uh, Dr. Ivan is with the Community and Economic Development Program at Michigan State University Extension. Uh, Dr. Ivan conducts the community and economic development program statewide at Michigan State University Extension. A frequent guest lecturer on small town success with state and municipal leagues and other national and regional small town conferences. Dr. Ivan has conducted previous research on community sustainability, including the 2002 USDA Fund the Rural America Project entitled Small Town Success Strategy. And the 2004 project entitled Can Small Towns Be Cool? His current research examines small community approaches to compete in the new economy, which was recently recognized by the Community Development Society as its National Research Award winner. His seminar topics have included community sustainability, downtown development strategies, community entrepreneurship strategies. Uh, Dr. Ivan has an MBA degree from Penn State University and a PhD in Community Sustainability from Michigan State University. And I would say that, that following the program, I think that Dr. Ivan would uh, be happy to answer any questions or receive your info. So, uh, Dr. Ivan. Great. Thank you very much. this morning at 4 a.m., which is 2 a.m. your time, okay? And then I'm gonna get up at 4.30 tomorrow morning to head to catch my flight out of Denver uh, to get back to Michigan, because I have a class I have to teach, not a choir. But today I'm gonna talk to you folks about small community success. In terms of what does it take to help a community kind of change its trajectory? kind of look at what can we do differently to help make our community a better place. So when you think about communities, when you think about communities, describe to me what you consider a cool place. What are some of the things that come to mind? This is the audience interaction part. <laughs> Recreation, great. Other things? Shopping. Good restaurants. Hospital. Hospital. Good medical care, right? Good, job. Good jobs. What? Schools. Schools. Public transportation. Public transportation. Fun, things fun things to do. And perhaps even fun people, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, those are all kind of the suite of things that we see in successful small towns and big cities as we look at cool communities. So I've had the opportunity to travel across the country, to look at communities. The W.K. Kellogg Foundation, the, the serial people have said, you know, Dave, a lot of the love goes to the big cities like Boston, or Austin, Texas, Santa Fe. And we believe in rural places, in small towns. And so they provided some funding for me to travel across the country to kind of look at those communities that were doing a good job in terms of adding a level of vitality. So I visited more than 300 communities across the country in 20 states, about a frequent flyer miles. Sat down with a variety of different people. I'd go into town and visit with people like you, 
I'd visit with people like Scott, city and village, village managers, business owners, say, what's happening in your community? What is it that makes your place special? And what is it that perhaps other communities can learn from you? Okay. And so then we kind of identified a series of best practices. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. So really, I'm going to look at three levels of analysis. First, what are some of those individual, or those themes, and then kind of drill down, kind of unpack it, so to speak, in terms of real stories from real communities, in terms of what they're doing. But it goes beyond simply aesthetics, in terms of a nice downtown. Our analysis really digs deeper in looking at communities. In Michigan, we did a cool city survey. What's the first city that comes to mind when I say Michigan? <laughs> Detroit. Good image? No, horrible image. Horrible image. We knew that. And if a city or if a state's going to be a great place, it's often defined by its largest city. And so we had to say, OK, what do people think? What do particularly younger people think about communities? And so we did a survey, 13,000 young adults completed an online survey, and we did some focus groups to really dig down in terms of what they're looking at for a future place to uh, live. So I'm going to start us out with a video, OK? And this is kind of a cool community, I think. I've worked with them. It's a bigger city. So it's kind of an apples to orange comparison to Raton. But let's uh, watch the video carefully and particularly the words that appear, okay? And then we'll have a little discussion about that.
Okay, as you saw that video, and some of the words that were on that screen, what were some things that kind of stuck out? Innovative. 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 Yeah, innovation. Collaboration, exactly. Other things? Arts. What's that? Top 10 in many. Top 10, yeah, they, they score pretty well. And, and Grand Rapids is a, is a happening city. It's on Michigan's what we call the, the West Coast. It's very cool, you know, with the, with the dunes there. But you know, at the beginning they talked about, you know, there's a lot of things, every city has buildings, right? Every city has people. But what they talk about is what differentiates us is how our people work together and how we collaborate and how we have a vision in terms of who we want to be. And let me tell you, 20 years ago, Grand Rapids was a struggling community. But they had very strong leadership and a community that came together and says, we don't want to be good, we want to be great. And they had a vision and they're executing it. Now that's a large city, I get it, I understand that we can't always compare large cities the communities like Raton. But what we can do is learn from them, right? And I think as we look at trying to create cool communities, what we're talking about is really moving from business and industry to people and human talent and building our community on talent. Moving from physical infrastructure to creative infrastructure so that whatever occupation I'm involved in, I can live and operate out of this community. We're talking about moving from economic development to really community development. And the difference is that everyone is engaged in setting that community's vision. And we're moving from quality of life to quality of place, where people are involved in enjoying the amenities in the community. And lastly, we're moving from natural resources to natural amenities where I can touch, where I can participate, and fully experience the beauty that's around me. So we identified, through our research, really five themes that differentiate those communities that are experiencing success. And so what I'm going to do is take each one of these individually and give you examples of other small towns, just like your community, and what they're doing. So the first success theme that we saw was a commitment to entrepreneurial development and trying to identify their community as the place where entrepreneurs want to do business. The successful communities recognize that it's really a two-point strategy. It's about creating an environment where people want to do business and then drilling down to those individual entrepreneurs, okay? Creating an environment. And that's kind of hard because oftentimes we don't focus on that environment. We just look at how can we help individuals grow their enterprise without stepping back. And in small towns, and I live in a small town, about the same size as your community, Sometimes jealousies come in play. And so when someone is successful in their business, the chatter at the local coffee shop is, can you believe what John's doing? That crazy hoot. You know, oftentimes we pull people down versus prop them up. Right? And that's what the successful communities have recognized. It says if we're going to be good, if we're going to be great, we have to celebrate everyone's success. That's right. We have to celebrate their success. And to do that, you're probably going to be clapping a lot tonight. <laughs> <laughs> to do that, that means that we have to help prop them up. And sometimes people are going to fail. Sometimes people are going to fail. But darn it, thank you for trying. 
And that's why oftentimes entrepreneurs like to work in big cities, because they can kind of fly under the radar, right? In a smaller town, it's more difficult to do. So as a community, we have to support these individuals. What we saw in these communities that were successful in entrepreneurial development is that they had a local champion, someone who, someone who said it's my job to make sure that we develop a strong entrepreneurial support system. And they were building on the local talents that they have as a community. They had strong social networks that connected entrepreneur to entrepreneur. And again, specific actions were taken to support those entrepreneurs. And the communities, the communities were all very welcoming and in experimentation and innovation. And again, that's something that small towns tend to struggle with. Okay. So let me give you a couple of examples. Fairfield, Iowa, little bigger than Raton, population's probably around 12,000 people. This is my poster child of entrepreneurial development. They recognize and celebrate entrepreneurs on a daily basis. You go to their local newspaper, comes out actually weekly, they have an entrepreneur column. They have an Entrepreneur of the Year award that their chamber and their entrepreneur association gives. The individuals who are again starting businesses and growing their enterprises. They have the most extensive mentoring program I've ever witnessed in the community. If I want to start a business, I'll get a phone call from the Fairfield Entrepreneurs Association and they'll say, Dave, we hear that you're interested in starting a business. Can we have lunch with you or breakfast? And over the course of that meal, they're going to say, we're here to help you. We're here to kind of provide advice, kind of show you what the landmines are, kind of give you a heads up of perhaps some of the political environment. And of course, we'll sign any confidentiality agreement that you need us to sign, but we want you to be successful. And the only thing we ask, the only thing we ask is that when your business is a success, you mentor others. So that I have this cadre of individuals helping individuals, sharing their expertise, helping them grow their enterprises. Now we know that funding, particularly in small towns, can be a challenge, right? And so this small town of 12,000 people has their own angel fund, where people are investing money into hometown businesses. And they have their own venture fund, where people will take actually an equity interest to help grow their enterprises. So how is this small town done? Not too bad. Last 20 years, they've created 3,000 new jobs. And more importantly, personal income has tripled. Pretty impressive. When you go to their website, it doesn't talk about the events happening in the community, it talks about the Fairfield Entrepreneur Association and the relocation program that they have and how you can connect with our network. Very extensive program. Columbus, Indiana, a little bigger community, about 30,000 people, but they too are trying to develop an ecosystem to support their entrepreneurial development. It starts much like Fairfield with strong networking entrepreneur to entrepreneur. They call it the Entrepreneur's Network, 10. Here's a picture of uh, one gathering that I took while I was there. We know, and the research shows, that most entrepreneurs look for business information between 10 o'clock at night and 2 o'clock in the morning. That's when they're kind of on their computer searching for information. Now, unless your chamber office is open at 10 o'clock in the night to 2 o'clock in the morning, a lot of entrepreneurs won't look locally for that information. And so what this small town has done is says, we gotta move everything to an online platform. We have to make it easy for our people to be successful. And in doing so, they've actually created a virtual front door. What I was impressed though, with was how they actually drill down to the students in their community, in terms of trying to plant seeds for future entrepreneurs. And so they have a business plan competition that awards prizes, pretty decent prizes too, for the most viable business or the most innovative business. Good stuff. One of my favorite examples, though, and this is a very small town, 
500 people. Westphalia, Michigan. Not too far, actually, from where I live. There it was the faith community, the church. This is kind of a one church town. Pretty much everybody in this small town is Catholic. And so St. Mary's Catholic Church took a lease on this downtown business, or downtown storefront. It's not, it wasn't any business. And then they went to their youth group. They said, kids, guess what? We just leased the building on the corner of Main and First. And we're going to give it to you. And we want you to figure out something to do with that business. And we're going to kind of back you for a couple years, but only two years. And then we want you to make sure that this business is viable. And so what the kids have done is actually created a student-run business called The Ark. It's filled an empty storefront, and it's become a gathering place in the community. It's so cool. If you go there at 3 o'clock after school gets out in warm weather, there's a line out the door because everyone is participating in, uh, and honoring this particular place of business. And what a valuable lesson for those kids, right? What a valuable lesson for them to say, you know what? You can do business in our particular community. Littleton, Colorado, you know, just outside of Denver, pioneered what I think is the quintessential economic development approach, and that's economic gardening. This is Chris Gibbons. Some of you who've worked in economic circles recognize that name. And what Chris has done is says, you know, we have to create a system whereby we use our resources at city government to help our businesses grow. Competitive knowledge, we negotiate rates on behalf of them. They have doubled their job baits from 50 to 30,000 and tripled the retail sales tax. A very successful approach in terms of looking at how they can build their retail base in their community. Another fine example, but a very different example, is Ord, Nebraska, population 1,200 people. Kind of like your community, this is a ranching community in the Sand Hills in Nebraska. And as these ranchers have aged, and in some cases passed, their sons and daughters, many of them, have left that community. They've moved to Omaha or Chicago or Denver. And when that ranch sells, that money leaves the community forever. And so what Ward did is he says, you know what? We would like to create a fund where people invest in our community. And so what we're asking people is, as you put your estate plan together, if our community has served you well, would you consider donating 5%, 5% of your estate to the community? And what we will do is use those funds very strategically to help advance our community. And so this small town of about 1,200 people now has a war chest of just under $12 million. That is allowing them to be very strategic in terms of luring businesses, primarily people coming back to the community, boomeranging, and establishing their businesses. They have a loan fund, they have an entrepreneurship program, which I'm going to talk about a little later. 5%. The second thing we saw in these communities is that they were looking at their human talent, the human skills that they have, and say, how can we capitalize on that? Those assets that we have, and move our human capital forward. You know, there's a lot of different assets as you look at small communities. You know, you want well-educated youth. Where it makes sense, we want to capitalize on green infrastructure. We want to have vibrant downtowns because a downtown is a face of a community. And oftentimes, people will judge the vitality of a community by the success of its downtown. And then immigrants can play an important role in terms of a community's long-term success. One of the communities that really changed its trajectory is Dubuque, Iowa. Little bigger community, but I think their story is worth sharing. Dubuque 
back in the 80s, led the Midwest in unemployment at 22.5%. They were considered the armpit of the Midwest, really a struggling, struggling community. And so as I visited with the leaders there in Dubuque, they shared with me in terms of how they're engaging young university talent. I said, well, that's interesting. You don't even have a university here. How are you engaging something you don't have? I says, well, if you go up the road about 35 miles, there's Whitewater, Wisconsin. And there's a, uh, a campus of UW there, University of Wisconsin at Whitewater. If you go another 30 miles south, southeast, there's Galesburg, Illinois. And there's a small college there. And so what they have done is essentially draw online around their community 60 miles and says, we want to connect with the youth in each of these universities and what we're doing in our community. They started by using a young professionals chapter with their chamber so that there's a formal connection. But then what they did was, I think, pretty remarkable. They established a very extensive internship program. And again, what the research will show is that if a person has a successful internship, wherever that may be, they're much more likely to actually choose that city or town or community as a place to live. And so what Dubuque has said is they've reached out to all these different universities that aren't in their town. They says, you know what? Through our internship academy, if you're a freshman, we want you to come to our community. And we'll kind of hook you up with someone to kind of shadow, kind of see what it means to work in this particular occupation whether that be a week, whether it be a day. We will give you a meaningful shadow experience. And if you're a sophomore, we'll give you a mentor, someone that's in a profession that you can call and talk to. And they may call you occasionally and check in. And they're going to hopefully develop a relationship with someone in a profession that you hope to serve. And then if you're a junior or senior, we promise to give you a meaningful internship. You're not just filing papers or taking out the trash, but something that's meaningful and that's going to advance your collegiate career. Very strategic in terms of how they're approaching this. And if you are in certain fields, like computer sciences, we've developed a loan forgiveness program so that we can help pay off part of your college loan if you come to work in our community. Kind of using an example that some smaller communities use in the medical profession, right, in terms of the lure doctors, the hard to reach areas. They've created a video, and I'm going to show it to you in just a second, that's really changed the perception of what people think about the community. But as I was talking to the mayor, he says, you know what, Dave, our world is changing so fast, kind of in this global economy. In the next five years, may candidly define the next 50 for our community. So we better get it right. We better be very aggressive in terms of how we try to position our community for long-term success. So let me show you this video, and I'll get your thoughts.
So what do you think? What were some of the things that kind of stuck in your mind as you saw that video? Small town values, yeah. How about some of the images? What's that? Excitement, absolutely. Fun. Young people. You know, demographically, Dubuque is not that young. Um, the other thing, you probably noticed quite a bit of diversity. And Dubuque is not that diverse. It's pretty Wonder Bread, to be honest with you. But they says, you know what, we want to showcase the type of place that young people want to be engaged in. And so we're going to show other young people and we're going to show diversity to the extent that we have it. You know, and I see that video and I spent part of this afternoon driving around your community. And I see the same bones in terms of the same opportunities here in this community as you see some of those images, right? Again, it's scaled, but nonetheless, I think that there's wonderful opportunities here. The other thing that's important, the other thing that's important in terms of community sec success is a strong education system. And I looked at communities that really was very proactive in terms of saying, how can we lift up our school system and our education system? So I look at communities like Houston, Minnesota, population 1,200 people. This part of Minnesota actually is pretty rural. And like many rural places, their enrollment's been going down, candidly, by a lot of kids that were being homeschooled. And so what the superintendent said is, you know what, I want to connect those homeschool kids to our school. And so what he did was he wrote a grant, and he bought computers, or got a grant, to allow him to place some computers that they were able to purchase in different households, and he negotiated a special internet rate to allow some connectivity. And then what he created was an online learning environment. It took some eyeball-to-eyeball -to -eyeball -to -eyeball conversations with the teachers' union that says, you know what, we're going to move to an online format and try to reach a whole new cadre of students. And to do that, we're going to need you to teach some online courses. And they've been very successful. In fact, they now have what's called the Minnesota Virtual Academy. 60%, I'm sorry, 70% of their school revenue comes from kids who don't reside in a district. In Minnesota, you're paid for by how many kids are enrolled in the district. I don't know how it is here in, in New Mexico. So I don't have to live in Houston, but if I enroll in classes. And they have the full cadre of advanced placement classes, five foreign languages, including Mandarin Chinese that is taught by a PhD who lives in mainland China. But what the superintendent did, and I was impressed, is he had a conversation with the kids. He says, you know, you're going to travel across the country, hopefully. And hopefully we've prepared you for that. Now, at some point, I hope you come back to our community because we've provided a world-class education. And we want you to remember that as you look at a future place to reside. So he's not just stopping there, but what he's trying to do is market the community to the next generation as a great place to live. Rochester, Indiana, about 4,000 people in northern Indiana. They've actually flipped their education system on its head, looking at how students or how companies you know, work in groups to solve problems. They have a lot of group projects and says, you know, if we're going to prepare students for the business environment, we have to mimic what they're going to encounter in the world, real world. And so they have this whole new tech high approach that really allows them to provide a different educational experience. What I was impressed there, though, was with the superintendent, who shared with me, she says, you know, I'm preparing students for the workforce. And then we have the economic development people here who are out there trying to lure jobs in our communities. And we're kind of in our own worlds. We're not talking to each other. And so what she started doing was going to the economic development conferences so that she could have a better understanding in terms of what were some of the challenges that that community is facing, that she can integrate into the school system. And then she dragged her counterpart's butt in the economic development office with her to the education conferences. 
so that he understood their world. And they've made these bridges in terms of saying, you know, we're one community, and we can't operate in silos. And we have to work collectively if we're going to be successful. The third thing that we saw in these communities was strong social capital, networks that really strengthen the community bonds, broad engagement. People were interested in helping to advance their community. Much like you folks are coming out tonight. And that includes the young adults. These communities drilled down to those young professionals and students in their communities and made sure that there was a youth voice in helping to set that community agenda so that they felt a part of the community. So a couple of different examples in terms of how communities are engaging their residents. St. Joseph, Michigan, population about 4,000 people. You know, even small towns have neighborhoods, right? And so what they do, the elected officials, is they actually bring people together at various neighborhoods in a small town. Oftentimes people bring their lawn chairs and they'll sit in the backyard and they'll talk about important issues. These neighborhood town hall meetings. And they get between 75 and 120 individuals at these type of conversations. What I was really impressed is that they develop a community calendar. It lists all the meetings. When the city commission's meeting, when the park and rec board's meeting, when the planning commission's meeting, when the school board's meeting. Everything that they could jam on that. And then they hand deliver it to every household in that community. Knock on the door and say, here's your community calendar for 2015. And we hope that all these meetings that are listed that your schedule will allow you to show up and participate in the conversation. When I talk to the city manager, he says, you know what's job one? It's critical that we look at how we can continually engage our residents. Marshall, Michigan, population about 7,000 people, about the same size as your community. They have what's called Marshall and a focus. You know, a lot of communities have strategic planning processes, right? Many of you have probably participated in them. You always get, get that same 10 or 12 same people who show up. Thank God they show up, right? Because if they did, we wouldn't have anybody. Well, Marshall said, you know, there's a lot of people who have great ideas that just don't show up at public meetings. And so what they created was a process called a meeting in a box, where they developed a set of questions, and they distributed it to people across the community. They says, you know what, we'd like you to sit down with your family, your friends, your out-of-town visitors that have a stake in our community, and kind of work your way through these communities around the kitchen table, backyard deck, whatever the case may be. And just jot a few notes down. They got a completely different data set in terms of what was important to that community and helping it to move forward. Sometimes it's the simple things. Sometimes it's the simple things that get people engaged and feel part of a community. This small town, Coopersville, Michigan, population 3,000 people. When you drive into it, it's got this sign that says, welcome to Coopersville. And what we do is we salute a local nonprofit, a local business person, and a local educator in our school system. They change it every quarter, and at the end of the year, they have a community celebration honoring those people. When I talked to the people at the local coffee shop, they said this small thing has done more to create a sense of pride in the community than a lot of other activities. So sometimes it's the low-hanging fruit that's easy to move a community forward. You know, as we look at trying to engage young individuals, kind of like what Dubuque was doing, it's key to kind of connect them where they're gathering. And there's kind of this third place factor, you know, there's a home, there's work, and then there's kind of this third place, right, where people hang out. That's where we want to connect with individuals. It's kind of this social condenser. Even in small towns, it's important that Young professionals have an opportunity to connect with other young professionals. So I think a young professional organization, or YPO, is crucial, no matter what size your community. Birds of a similar feather flock together. Right? Again, think of Dubuque in that video. They were trying to create a sense of pride of young individuals interfacing with other young individuals. 
And the important thing is that you provide an authentic opportunity for these young professionals to engage in community decision making. One of my favorite examples is a group out of Youngstown, Ohio called Thinkers and Drinkers. What a great name, huh? So let me tell you about Thinkers and Drinkers, or actually let me tell, let them tell you. It's Thomas Okay, so you kind of get the gist. A group of young people get together at an adult drinking establishment, put different ideas in a hat and how they can make their community better, draw an idea out of a hat, and have a conversation. Then based on that conversation, they then take it to the appropriate channels, whether that be your economic development group, whether that be your Main Street program, whether that be your chamber, city hall but it provides an authentic opportunity for them to kind of talk about how we can make our community better. The other thing that Thinkers and Drinkers is doing is really changing the narrative of that community. You know, I don't know if you know the history of Youngstown. It's a steel community, or at least was a steel community. Kind of like what Raton was a mining community, right? Years ago. And back in the day, Back in the day when the steel industry was humming along, <coughs> Youngstown was a great place to live because those steel jobs were well paying. It was number two in the country behind Pittsburgh in steel production. And so the thinkers and drinkers went to their local chamber luncheon because they were invited to kind of talk about their program. And they shared with me how they were sitting around a table with some people who've been in the community for quite a while. And these individuals were kind of reminiscing of old Youngstown, the good old days, so to speak, when those steel jobs were around and everybody had a great paying job. And the thinkers and drinkers says, you know what we did? We looked them in the eye and we said, stop it. Stop it. We weren't even born when those jobs were in our community. As long as we continue to talk about the past and where we've been, we're never really going to focus on where the conversation should be. And that's where we're headed. Yes. So what, what they're doing at Thinkers and Drinkers is really changing the narrative in their community. And I contend that oftentimes people move in the direction of the conversation. So if I go to the coffee shop here and people are pissing and moaning about this town, 
Sorry for the French. <laughs> then that kind of sets the tone, right? That sets the tone. And so what they're trying to do in Youngstown is say, no, we've got to talk about the positive things that we have. We have to talk about the assets we have. Not what we don't have, but what we have. And let's build on that. Amen, right? Amen. So that's what I share with you. As you look at your community, it's important that you, in this audience, set that tone in terms of the positive conversations that are taking place in your community. The other thing we saw in these successful communities is that they were very deliberate in their efforts to engage youth. So I'm going to give you a simple idea. And that's to provide a disposable camera. You know, today with digital, you don't even need a disposable camera. And ask the young individuals, high school, middle school, whatever the case, to take pictures of what they like and what they dislike in the community. And perhaps share that at a future planning commission meeting, city commission meeting, chamber meeting, whatever the case may be. You'll be astounded. It's called photo voice. Oftentimes, people don't want to talk about it, but they can share pictures. I do a lot of community coaching, and I remember this as if it was yesterday. I was in a small town in Michigan called Carroll, Michigan. Beautiful young high school girl, senior. Tears running down her eyes as she talked about her hometown and how she loved her hometown but she wasn't going to be able to stay here because she showed picture after picture of empty storefronts in their downtown. And to her, those empty storefronts meant no opportunity. And so what we had to devise in that community was a strategy so that we could add a level of vitality in that downtown. It may not be a business, but we can have something in that storefront, usually high school art. This type of process allows you to tap into that youth voice. So it's important that we connect with our youth. Oftentimes, it's through arts and culture. That's one avenue that we can connect with youth. And it's important that we create a positive memory. Because the research shows, I'm a researcher, and so I look at a lot of people's research. The research shows that if an individual has a positive experience growing up in the community, they're much more likely to boomerang back to that community. They may leave, but they're more likely to come back at some, place, some stage in their life. So we want to create that positive memory. And we need to create an authentic voice for these youth. So a couple of examples. Bothell, Washington, population about 4,000 people. They have community banners. So you can go to downtowns, you know, you see these banners. Well, in Bothell, here's their banners. If you look carefully, these are kids. I did a little focus group at the uh, middle school, and the kid says, did you see my picture at 3rd and Elm? They absolutely knew where their picture was. And I was taking a couple of these pictures, and one of the things I know is you can't really see it here, but this picture right here is a picture of a skateboarder. Now, how many towns have pictures of skateboarders in their downtown? One, Bothell. Just the opposite, no skateboarding here, right? <laughs> Which to the kids mean no fun here, right? And so what they have said is, you know what, we want to celebrate those things that are important to the kids. New York Mills, Minnesota, population about 1,500 people, small town. They have a visiting arts program that connects with their high school so that they can learn from different artists that are touring the area. One of my favorite examples is Dwajak, Michigan. About again, the same size as your community. They have a community festival called the Dogwood uh, Fine Arts Festival. They bring in top-notch entertainment for this community festival. So here's the thing. If you're gonna, if you're gonna perform at our community festival, you're required by contract 
to spend some time in our school system. Do we have any jazz fans here? You ever hear of the Neville brothers, you know, Charles and Art Neville? Sure. So this is Charles Neville right here jamming with the high school jazz band. So I ask you, how cool is it for this young gen gentleman here, or these young ladies here, to be jamming with the internationally known jazz musician? They're going to remember that for the rest of their life. Again, creating those positive memories so that people come back to our community. Jonesville, I'm going to go back to Jonesville because they do so many good things. Population about 3,000. They always survey their residents. And they ask them, you know, what is it that you like about our community? In this case, in this particular survey, they asked their senior citizens, what was it that kept you in our community, that rooted you here? And just as I mentioned, they says, you know what, we had a good time growing up here. There was some jobs at the time, and we stayed put because we liked this community. I mentioned that they're always surveying different people, including their different age groups. About seven years ago, they asked their third graders, what is it that we can do for you as a community? Typical third grade response, he says, you know what? We'd like a rock wall. <laughs> Sounds like third graders, right? So what did the community do? They built it. Yep, they, they built it. I've mentioned that they're always doing these surveys every few years. And about five years ago, they were surveying different age groups, and they were like off the chart with seventh graders. It says either we have a sampling error or something's up here. And so did a focus group. It says, why are you scoring us so high? We're just curious. You know what these seventh graders said? Back in elementary school, we asked for a rock wall, and you built it. You know, we tend to discount the youth voice, right? We don't listen to them. We don't listen in terms of what they say they want. And more importantly, we act upon what they say. Jonesville gets it. Jonesville understands if they have a chance in hell of these kids coming back to their community, they have to listen to them and act upon their wishes. You know, there's a lot of community strategies in terms of what it takes to engage youth and younger families. One is to create economic and career choices that are enticing to them. And I know you're saying, Dave, that's easier said than done. But I'm not sure that we fully expose them to the opportunities that may be available, including entrepreneurial opportunities. These are pictures from that town in Nebraska, Ord. Remember with that $12 million war chest? They have a very extensive youth entrepreneurship program that starts when these kids are in second grade connects them with real entrepreneurs. Five of their downtown businesses are a direct result of this program that's been ongoing for a number of years. Secondly, evolve community cultures that are embracing of youth in the younger generation. So if we have a community festival, perhaps in addition to the fiddlers or the country band that we have each year, we provide an opportunity for the local garage bands to perform. And it's not at 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Thirdly, proactively link your community goals and strategies to the attraction of young people. And then lastly, focus your development efforts on those who perhaps want to return to your downtown. Return to your community, not just your downtown. So, story here. I give a lot of stories. Brookfield, Missouri, population 1,200 people. So they says, you know what, we want to send a message to our high school graduates. And so at graduation ceremony, this is actually at the uh, rehearsal the day before, they give each high school graduate a gift. And that gift is a mailbox. And that mailbox has a kid's name on it. And inside that mailbox is a letter to the community, from the community. And I'm going to kind of paraphrase it. It says, you know, we're so proud of you. We're proud of your accomplishments growing up here in Brookfield. Many of you may be leaving our community. We wish you well. We want you to meet new friends, explore the world, gain new ideas. But always remember, always remember that Brookfield is your hometown. And as a reminder, 
we already have a mailbox with your name on it. Wow. Wow. What a powerful message, right? What a powerful message for these kids. Oftentimes, our story is, there's no future here for you. You have to leave, right? That's the narrative. That's our negative conversation. Brookfield is just the opposite. We want you to come back. And in fact, we have a mailbox with your name on it. Been very successful. In fact, the kids are so touched. This is one kid, Sam Thudium, here at his high school open house, his graduation. And the mailbox, pretty simple, just to receive some cards. Again, setting that narrative. You know, as we look at involving youth, we can do it at three levels. We can do things to youth, we can do things for youth, or we can do things with youth. Oftentimes, we're over here, you know, telling them what they can't do. Or we recruit them for things. True story. I put trash pickup because it involves my family. So my kids are a little older now. My son's 23, my daughter's 21. Been in high school, good kids. My son was in the National Honor Society, and they do a lot of community service. And we've always tried to instill the importance of community service. And on one Sunday afternoon, they said they're doing a trash pickup, and they called and said, you know, we're going to do our trash pickup. Can we count on you? And he says, sure, I'll be there. And he hung up the phone, and he says, you know what, Dad? I think the only thing my community wants me for is to pick up trash. You know, so sometimes we have to be careful in terms of the line, the line we walk relative to the messages we send, right? Now, obviously, it's important that we instill a level of volunteerism, but we also have to send a strong message that we want you to help set that community agenda. And so what we need to do is kind of move down this continuum and do things not only for youth but with them in terms of actual events that they're planning and they're making the decisions in the community. Fourthly, what we saw repeatedly in these communities is a strong quality of place. They look at their place and says, how can we make sure that it shines? It's more of this and less of that. And this is kind of any place USA, right? This is Manistee, Michigan, population about 4,000 people. Really a vibrant downtown that they had. You know, we've become so commoditized that we don't even have to put names on our businesses, right? We know that this is KFC. We know that this is Pizza Hut, right, exactly. So what we want to do is kind of create these vibrant environments that people say, I want to be a part of that community. And it's really all about placemaking. It's about looking at our community and say, how can we create a place where people want to be a part of our community? Rebecca Ryan is from Wisconsin. Her and I often do work together. And she said, you know, this next generation of talent is the first to identify more strongly with their communities than their employers. Case in point. The day after graduation, he graduated from Michigan State. My son graduated the day after he moved to Chicago. He didn't have a job. Why would you need a job? <laughs> he identified with that community. Now, he's got a good job now, but that's what that ge this generation looks for. They want a community that they can feel a part of. Remember that research I talked about in terms of 30,000 online surveys? Here's what the youth told us in terms of what they're looking for in the community. I want you to focus on this column because many of them, about one out of five, 20%, said that they want to live in a smaller community. And as they look at smaller communities, they look for the scenic beauty. And what a beautiful setting you have in Raton. They want safe streets, affordability, a place for a family, good schools, a sense of community, low traffic. Again, all the ingredients that I think you have here in your community. So what does this mean? It really means building on your unique history. This is your community, by the way. Do you recognize that photo? OK, good. And identifying the assets to kind of build the pride that you have. And then hopefully when we do that, we're increasing social interaction. 
Anybody tell me what this building's being used for? If you, if you saw this building in your community, what would you guess it is? House, yeah. Okay, but let's say we want to make that house a business. What kind of business could we use in that? Bed and breakfast. Bed and breakfast. That looks like a bed and breakfast from New England, right? Museum. Others? Health clinic. Health clinic. Could be a health clinic. Whoops. A law office. Yeah, a lot of times professional offices. Let me give you another clue. Can you see this right here? Can you see those golden arches? This is McDonald's in um, Freeport, Maine, home of L.L. Bean. A few years ago, McDonald's bought this building. And they were going to propose a very prototypical McDonald's. And the planning commission says, you know what, we're going to love a McDonald's. Our kids will love it. It will be an asset to your community, but you're not tearing down that building. And McDonald's took them to court, and the community won. And McDonald's took them to appeals court, and the community won because they had their act together relative to historic preservation. And so I've been to this McDonald's, and it's the only McDonald's I've ever been to that actually has white tablecloths. It's very upscale. And they actually have on their menu lobster rolls. It's in Maine. Now, it's not on part of the dollar menu. <laughs> Just want to make that clear. <laughs> it's interesting. So you also can look at the subway and other fast food establishments that have protected that community. So again, looking at the assets that they have in the community. So we're really creating places and not designs. And so as you look at your community, you want to create special communities. That's more than a single project. But how do we connect it together as a community? And it's really an ongoing process. You're not finished and done. It's one project leads to the next project leads to the next project. And there's really four elements in terms of creating a successful place. One, you want to connect your community. So as you look at, for example, what I call your second main street over by the train, train station, right? Picture I showed up here. How do you connect that to the other main street, right? So it's pretty seamless for individuals. You want to have a level of comfort, that people feel that this is a great place, a place that they want to be. You want to make sure it's functional. Oftentimes, and I'm a sociologist, I'll just sit and watch. Sit on a bench and watch people. And what's the functionality of that place? And then lastly, what's the sociability? You want people to connect with one another. And so how do we make sure that our communities encompass these four elements. The other thing is a lot of communities say, well, we want to be a destination. And there's a thing called the power of 10. Okay? To be a destination, a large city, or look at yourself as a region, looking at the other communities in this region. You really have to have 10 plus destinations within that region, a collection of communities. So maybe your region stretches from Taos to um, Pueblo. Okay. And then within each destination, you need to have 10 plus places that people can go to. And then each place has to have 10 plus things to do. Okay. So as you start trying to unpack this for your community, start looking at what are those things that people can do in our community, and how do we connect them with our place? Okay. I think arts and culture can play a key role. We've seen this repeatedly in terms of economic development in small communities. Paducah, Kentucky is kind of the poster child nationally in terms of their artist relocation program and the financing that they put together to make that happen. But we've also seen it in other smaller communities, like Petoskey, Michigan, where the Crooked Tree Arts Association, which is in this church downtown, really connects the various art organizations in one place so that they're not tripping over one another in a community. I talked about St. Joseph earlier in terms of those, their activities. They have an arts incubator that serves as a gathering place within the community. But in doing so, we want to make sure that it's not overly contrived, that it's authentic to who the community is and what it represents. And so there's this community in Indiana. I don't want to give its name because I don't like to throw communities under the bus. But this community has received some awards. And they had a local entrepreneur who says, you know, I want to make my community special. And he reached into his pocket and invested $20 million to create this artist colony. 
really nice stuff. I mean, you can see the pictures here. Major improvements. I mean, place on the surface looks very nice. But let me tell you about this community. It's a very conservative community. It's a home of a Christian uh, college. It has a reputation of being a dry community, as many communities in Indiana do. Are, excuse me. And we know that artists can be a little more free-spirited, right? And so what they were trying to create, invent themselves as, and what their roots were, really were at a disconnect. So people weren't coming to this place. And frankly, it's struggling. And I compare that to a community not too far from it, actually. Three Oaks, Michigan, where a group of individuals, local, says, you know what, we want to lift our community up by the bootstraps. And so one couple opened this downtown theater to show classical films. Another um, two guys purchased this uh, factory, we used to make feather bones here, and converted it into a theater. Another couple converted the bowling alley into this eclectic furniture store. They're using every available space. This is lane eight right here. So, but what I was impressed with is the people in this community. This is Dawn Pruitt. She owns this art shop. And Dawn moved to this community from Montana. And she shared with me how they're trying to be a part of the fabric of the community. So part of that fabric, and this is primarily an ag community, is saying, how can we contribute to the traditions that define this community? One of those traditions is the annual Christmas parade. And so what the artists did was create their own costumes, marched in a parade, and said, we're one community. We're not the artists over here and you folks over here. We're one community. And this is a small village that's done this with no professional manager, not a dime in state arts funding. It's all been kind of bootstrapped by themselves. My favorite quote is from Teddy Rose. So do what you can with what you have where you are. Not trying to be someone else. Not being Santa Fe or Taos or Pueblo, but being Raton in terms of the assets that you have as your community. Lastly, you folks have been very patient, and thank you. And that is what we saw repeatedly in these communities, that there was a conviction to get it done. And they're not, again, waiting for that grant to fall in their lap. They're not waiting for something to happen. It says, if we're going to be successful, we have to be proactive. We have to come together as a community and decide what that vision is. And it really sometimes starts with the petunias. And what I mean by that is the simple projects, the low-hanging fruit, right, in terms of what can we do to maybe test the concept, to kind of move our community forward, and then build the confidence to address the next thing on our to-do list. And oftentimes, visibility brings that support. It creates a movement within a community. So a couple final examples. Tecumseh, Michigan. They also do a lot of community surveys. One of their community surveys says they'd like to have a fine dining establishment. People are tired of driving half hour to a nice restaurant. Problem was the community didn't have a liquor license, and I understand that's an issue here in New Mexico too. So they had to do a little horse trading to be able to get a liquor license. And then here's what's cool. They formed a committee in the community and they had chefs come in and prepare tasting menus. And this committee says, all right, you know what, based on what our price points are as a community, here's a chef that we think will be successful. And the entrees that they prepared, that's gonna kind of resonate with who we are as a community. This restaurant, the Evan Street Grill, when it opened about 15 years ago, was based, named the best new restaurant in all of Michigan. Today, it's still very, very successful. Final example, Argonia, Kansas. Has anybody ever been to Western Kansas? You know, it's pretty remote, kind of like parts of New Mexico, right? And a few years ago, their one and only grocery store closed when the owners retired. And 60 miles is a long ways to drive for a gallon of milk. And so what the mayor did was they built this convenience slash grocery store on the edge of town. As a community, they built it. It says, we're gonna operate this as a community cooperative because we have to keep people in our community. And people really felt good about that. And he kind of used the momentum from that project to say, you know what, we're losing people. We have to get people to come into our community. 
And so he was able to get some land right on the edge of town. And he worked with some builders, local builders. And they started building houses. And they offer them at cost to people who want to move in a community. So you can buy this ranch right here for approximately $54,000. Good deal. And you know what? If you uh, have kids that you enroll in our school district, we'll pay your closing costs. Argonia, Kansas is not a cool community, as some of the adjectives we used earlier. This is a community that is struggling. But this is a community that is going to push whatever button they need to push to make sure that they don't wither and die on the vine. That's what leadership's all about. That's what community change is all about, in terms of saying, what can we do as a community to change our trajectory? So what can we learn from successful places, other places that have been successful? We want to create quality places to live. We want to retain the talent that we have. Would that talent be at the hospital, entrepreneurs, whatever the case may be. We want to retain them in our community. We want to welcome entrepreneurs, create this environment where they feel part of our community, and we support them in their endeavors. We want to welcome and celebrate the diversity because it's our differences that make us better. We need to support education at all levels. At all levels. And we want to promote community engagement. And that engagement needs to go down to the youth. And finally, we have to adapt a can-do attitude. An attitude that says, we can do better. We will do better. You know, oftentimes as I go to communities, there's a poverty of spirit in these communities. And so the communities that have been successful recognize that they can do better. And oftentimes that starts with listening to the community. And you have to know your community. <laughs> you have to know your community. And if your community is telling you that it's sick, then it's time for action, right? It's time for action. The talent for that action exists in this room. And I wish you the best of luck in future endeavors. Thank you very much. Any questions? By the way, before I answer any questions, you don't know how lucky I was. I was at in these, uh, New York, and this doesn't happen very often, but occasionally she'll stretch, and I just happen to be at the right place at the right time. So, <laughs> questions? Yes, go ahead. Not a question, kind of a comment. Yeah, it's, it's, it's inspiring, actually. Yeah, great, thanks. Questions? Comments? Yes? Uh, Call me Dave. Uh, we're having a discussion going the quality of life.
So the question was, I'll kind of repeat it. So you know, we talk about quality of life, and, and obviously quality of life starts with the paying jobs, right? So that people can, can have the resources to uh, enjoy the amenities and perhaps build those amenities in the community. So how do you, how do you build an economic base that, um, that has those good paying jobs, right? I'm kind of paraphrasing, but I think that was kind of the, uh, uh, and what opportunities may exist, particularly in this community, right? So, you know, as I look at this community, you're about 200 miles from Denver. You're about 200 miles from Amarillo, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then 200 from Albuquerque to Albuquerque? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're kind of in the center, right? Uh, which is about a three hour drive. And so you capitalize in terms of, okay, what is it that we offer? Why is it that I want to live, would want to live in community? What is it that attracted me from Kalamazoo, Michigan, to live in Trinidad, just up the road. I drove through Trinidad on my way down here. Similar type community. Um, to live in this part of the country versus a more larger city, right? And so again, remember that list of things that people said, you know, good schools, uh, um, uh, low traffic. So, you know, you, you have those bones, so to speak. But I think to get to your specific in terms of what opportunities may exist, You know, it's tough for me as an outsider that spent, has spent about six hours in this community um, to say, yeah, here's, here's your secret sauce, so to speak, in terms of, of how you're going to add jobs to this community. I think what you need to do is look at what are the assets that we have. So we have a pretty good medical facility. I'm guessing that because you ladies are all wearing the same colored coat, right? Um, <laughs> You're not even on sales, right? <laughs> so, so what are the assets that we have? Okay, we have a good medical facility. Actually, we have two medical facilities, right? We have a minor's hospital, and then we have the, uh, the county facility, right? When they're building a new facility. And then I think there's some uh, potential opportunities um, across the road in terms of how we can use our old facility. So what's, those are good paying jobs, or they're, you know, professional jobs. And so how do we help to make sure that that profession grows? And what can we do as a community to support that one sector? So that's just one sector, okay? Then we, uh, we look at, okay, what other assets do we have as a community? What well, is this primarily an ag community, right? A lot of ranching that takes place in this part of the, the country. Are there value-added opportunities related to the ranching, ranching entities that exist, I don't know. But that may be one opportunity. You, you mentioned in terms of marketing and how do we market. Um, you know, one of the things we saw in terms of some of these other communities <coughs> is that oftentimes their businesses were working hand-in-hand -hand together, not trying to have a one-upmanship or, or in any way uh, be secretive, but recognize that if we're gonna be successful, right, we're kind of a rising tide raises all boats. And so we're kind of in this together. That's why these thick networks. And so in these communities, and you look at Fairfield, what they've done is through their networks, the businesses are helping each other. The businesses are helping each other connect and share resources. And I talk about economic gardening in terms of marketing, using very strategic information pooling resources and, and trying to create a, uh, a, a joint effort, so to speak. Uh, lastly, I think, um, you know, I think that there's tremendous opportunities to capitalize on technology. You know, when you look at the internet, it kind of makes the world a lot flatter, doesn't it? And so I can market to someone in New York City almost as easily if I live in 
uh, Raton, Rat, 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 Raton, right? I always, I kind of give the little French twist, right? <laughs> um, or Trinidad. As much as I, if I lived in New York, or as much as I lived in Denver or Albuquerque. So we want to make sure that we have strong connectivity. So whatever business I'm engaged in, do I have the internet and the ability to market online at the same level that a similar business would have in a larger city? I don't know that if that's the case here in your community or not. If it's not, then I think that's an area of opportunity for you in terms of what we saw in some of these smaller communities is they invested in that kind of infrastructure to make sure that they can be competitive in a global marketplace in terms of their marketing, not just to their trade area, but to the world. And that looks at the internet and the other technologies to kind of provide those type of accesses that otherwise wouldn't be available. So it's, it's not a real good answer, and I know that. Um, but again, I haven't really looked at your, your data uh, extensively, so I, I don't want to kind of give you a line without you know, spending some time you know, pouring over your economic data and finding you know, are there certain location quotient with some very fancy economic terms, but certain industries that you have a competitive advantage that you can build upon. And so that's where you want to start. What are those industries that we can build upon? We talked about the medical as perhaps one of those. Okay, sorry. Uh -huh. Which, uh, the one, the, and the, oh, oh yeah, the ARC, yeah, I'm sorry, that was a, uh, a <laughs> sub shop slash ice cream shop slash whatever kids want to buy <coughs> thing. So it's kind of a mishmash, to be honest, something that none of us would start uh, because they really didn't have a focus, but it worked. So it was kind of a sandwich shop, ice cream plates. Other questions? I don't have a question, I have a comment. Okay. Uh, I'm Dennis Downing and I've been here 15 years. Mm -hmm. Anybody that stands still for three minutes, I'll tell them, why don't we have a welcome sign to our city? We're proud of it. Welcome to our city. He had a little tiny town, or Nebraska, mm -hmm. it was a big population. 3,000. Of, of creating that kind of signage. Um, yeah, good thought. Excellent thought. Well, um, you know, uh, what we've seen in these communities, so the question is who's responsible for that? You know, a lot of times people will point fingers. Well, that's the job of the city, or that's the job of the chamber. You know, what we saw in these communities, it's everybody's job. Yeah. In, in terms of saying, you know what, I'm a, I'm a citizen of this community. And so I'm going to make sure, and I'm going to volunteer. And so they have what's called change groups, you know, that just community betterment groups. Cuts across a lot of different layers, involves a lot of different people. It's easy to kind of plug in, so to speak, and contribute. And so that way it's not, well, that's their job or that's their job, but it's everybody's job. Good question or good comment. Thank you. Yes. So I can give you a couple of ideas, okay? Um, and, and oftentimes, you know, there's not gonna be a, a windfall of money. You're not gonna get $10,000 or 25,000 or whatever the case may be. But you have to start somewhere. And so 
uh, what some communities have done is again turning to the internet and, and crowdsourcing uh, as an opportunity to um, uh, provide a place where people want to reinvest in their community. They list projects uh, and people can say, you know what, I'm going to write a check for $100. Some communities, my community is one of them, uh, use the example of Ord. And they now have a community foundation. And so the community foundation, people again invested in their community to kind of recycle some of this money. Oftentimes the money is there, it's just people have to know what that idea is. Then you give you a, another example, and this is an extreme example, and I apologize. So there's one town I went to in Iowa, Preston, Iowa. Again, about the same size as your community. And um, they kind of took a page out of Ord's playbook, and they says, you know what, we want to talk to people who used to live in this community. And so what they did was they went to the people who are kind of the class presidents for a number of years, because they're the ones who always organize class reunions, right? <laughs> and, and so they have probably the best list of where these people are that used to live in a community, because every five or 10 years, people get together for a class reunion. And they put together a very comprehensive list of people who used to live in Preston, Iowa. And they developed a community newsletter. They sent it out electronically. The big heavy lifting was just putting that darn list together. And so they talked about what's happening in their community. And then they also talked about what their hopes were. What were some of those projects that they wanted to work on? One of them was a park. And they got a check, get this, in the mail for a million dollars from a gentleman who used to live in this community who now has made a small fortune, a mid-sized fortune, um, in Alaska, um, connected with the oil industry. And he wrote them a letter. They just about fell out of their chairs. He says, you know, I'm so impressed. Thank you for reaching out. I always have fond memories of growing up in my community. Again, remember that positive memory thing. And I was so delighted to learn about what's happening in your community, in my community, my hometown. And so I want to make a contribution. And here's my contribution. Now, again, that's an extreme example. But I, I think that's a, one way that I've seen a couple communities have done is people that didn't used to look or live in a community, or people who used to live in a community have now kind of left to try to connect with them in terms of trying to reinvest. The last thing is, you know, you've got, and as I <coughs> drove around with Scott today, um, you've got some pretty wealthy individuals who have um, property that are is adjacent to your community, right? Um, and I'm speaking, thinking of specifically Ted Turner. You know, so, and Scott and I talked about this. You know, um, at some point, it would be worth the time to have another conversation with Mr. Turner. And says, you know what? Um, you're invested in this community by the virtue of your property being right against our community. And we would love to have you be a part of our community. Uh, and, and then present some specific ideas, you know, so not just leave it open, but say, you know, here's some things that we think would really benefit from that. And so again, it's cultivating that, that wealth that may either exist in the community or is connected to the community that you can kind of cultivate. Great question. Other questions? Yes. I just want to make a comment now that you brought up Ted Turner. If uh, Warren Buffett, I've done some research on Warren Buffett, he, he's buying uh, newspapers I didn't hear that about him, but yeah, maybe. He is buying newspapers throughout the country because he believes in sitting down, not on a computer to read the local news. He wants to open up a piece of paper to read the local news. And he is buying newspapers throughout the country. So that's something that we need, someone that we need to contact besides Ted Turner. You know, sometimes it's, it's thinking big, right? And, and the, the only thing that can happen is they say no, or they don't, they don't return your uh, call. But, you know, you never know until you ask, right? And sometimes we're afraid to ask, um, and, and we have to kind of get over that fear. Other questions? You guys are probably hungry, aren't you? Did you guys miss your dinner? So, very good. Yes? Yeah, and um, if you guys come up with some good, you know, a good uh, 
Hi, Bill. <laughs> Cave people, right? Citizens against virtually everything. Yeah. And, and every town, every town has their cave people, right? And oftentimes it's the cave people who set the community agenda. And you never will get to first base as long as that happens. And so, you know, thank you for your, your comments because I think, like you said, a lot of times communities have this poverty of spirit because it's the cave people who are, again, dragging everything down. And so it's time to say, no, no, we're going to move forward. We invite you to be a part of it. Now, you may not like it, but darn it, we're going to keep going. That's how things get done. Yes? Just a comment. Um, I, I don't think it's just Raton. I think it's all the communities in this northeast part of the state. Um, and our county at the moment is uh, working on a comprehensive plan and update. Uh, and I'm in the Cimarron community, and I sell real estate down there, and I go all over. And it's I've been the last five or six years. The comment that I've had from people, they say, "Look, we'd like to invest, but your county's going downhill. Your county's going down the tubes. Have you looked at the tone lately? You know, I just don't feel I want to invest in a community that still looks like it's going down. So as we move forward, and he talks about people who come to the meetings who are the energy that create the list or get it started, um, getting that second tier I think will be important and um, try to include the other communities and the county in that thought process. It's not just, in my example, say Cimarron or here just the tone, it's a regional effort. We all suck. So, <laughs> You know, but, let's, but looking forward. Right. So, yes. I think that government needs to get a little bit more excited about the city. Um, today I was going to take a walk. I never do. But I looked online for our parks, and I was looking at Roundhouse Park, which is a park in that area that has walking trails. And the website said, this is Roundhouse Park, future site of our aquatic center in Horseshoe oh, Town. <laughs> and those were built years ago. And it's just, I think we need to market our city better. And I think that starts with government at least keeping their website up to date. So, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to comment. So. I will say, I, so I spent part of this afternoon riding around with Scott. Uh, and, and you've got a city manager who cares deeply about this community. And, and he was sharing, you know, here's, here's what we think we can do. And he, he was showing project after project. So, um, you know, I, as an outsider, I was kind of excited about the prospects. But, you know, he's one individual. It takes a community 
right? And so that's where each of you kind of play that role. Um, and, and so sometimes, yeah, we get so inundated with our day-to-day -day -day stuff that, you know, websites get out of, out of date. And so we want to say, okay, um, how can I help make that website up to date? And, and so that's bringing it to people's attention, just as you did here, right? In terms of saying, you know, that needs to be updated um, because we want to be current. And so we wanted to make sure that we surface those type of opportunities. Good. Yes. If you're not on a committee, I hear you. I would do that. If um, <coughs> you were on a committee, um, is there any study you know of the last 10 to 20 years? I can, I've only been here two years. So they want to make it easy, you know, for people to kind of plug in, right? And so that's what thinkers and drinkers, very fluid, and they get together and it's fun, and people are a part of that change process. And so, and it's not really a formal committee per se, it's just a conversation, uh, and that, but that conversation leads to action. So different communities are going to have different strategies to moving things forward. You know, some committee approaches, I think your Main Street program, which is a very structured approach. Um, is, is one path, but there's other opportunities to just provide input and ideas uh, that we don't have a committee structure, but yet people want to help make this community better, right? And so we want to make sure that we leave no door, no stone, uh, let me say it that way, no stone left unturned in terms of opportunities for people to positively contribute to that community. You know, um, I, there's this one town, uh, St. Charles, Illinois, um, their website has all these wonderful opportunities for people to engage in their community. It's very fluid and very transparent and people kind of jump on and they make contributions and it's dynamic and people post things. So it was again that level of engagement that um, they, they were able to create with their community. And so you're going to have to figure out what works for this community in terms of how people feel that they can plug in to help creating positive change. Good comment. Yes. Center has been some friction in the past in this community. Um, you know, what I keep hearing though is people keep going to city government as the answer. I think they're part of the solution, but I wouldn't put all my eggs in that basket. And that's not in any way chipping away at what they can do. What we saw in the communities that we visited was that they, it wasn't city government that was driving the bus. It was the community that was driving the bus. And so sometimes if you're not being heard at, from city government, um, maybe, I'm just speculating here, maybe that's not a role of city government to address something. And so if, oh it is, <laughs> I, I can't say, I don't know. So, so I think there has to be a process where, again, you can move agendas forward without relying on city government. Uh, you know, this, the government can only do so much. Uh, great communities aren't built by government. They're built by the citizens. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I, I just feel a need, my name is Pat Walsh, and I just want to speak on behalf of people who have done volunteer work in this community. I moved here nine years ago. There was no recycling when I moved here. We have a recycling program now. There have been So I just want to 
want to say, you know, let's not overlook the things that people have stood up and done for free in this community to make it better. Well, a lot of, most communities are, to be honest with you. Most communities, it's, the, the real change happens through volunteers. All right, I don't see any, well, one more. So I'm going to give you an example. Thanks for sharing that. One of the communities we visited was called Charlotte. Um, they're in Michigan, not Charlotte, but Charlotte. Um, they're a small town, about the same size as your community. They have this organization called Can Do, Charlotte Area Networking for Development and Opportunities. And so what it is, it's very fluid, and it brings together different entities. So you have government there, you have the hospital there, you have the schools there, you have volunteers there. There's no membership, it's just one way that we can kind of break down the silos and just talk about opportunities and share information in a very wiki fashion, in an open source fashion, so that we can capitalize on the information each person has. I'm trying to use some tech terms for you guys. So, <laughs> so that may be a model that you consider, you know, a can-do type organization that kind of serves as a, a gathering place for uh, conversation and for ideas to kind of stimulate into action. Now you folks are ready to go home and eat, so I'm gonna let you folks go. Thank you so much.